Well, good morning. <laughs> morning. 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 Just checking you're alive. It's funny, without the tinkling on the ivories to sort of prepare us for the start of the service, it seems a little bit more abrupt. But welcome, you all. It's lovely for me to be back with you and uh, to spend the Lord's Day, starting the Lord's Day this morning, uh, praising Him uh, and worshipping Him. <coughs> A um, little bit of notices, very briefly, um, next week uh, I'll be preaching again, I will probably, if things go to plan, be looking at Deuteronomy 9. I was asked when I was visiting the old church in Suffolk that, that, that Ruth and I went to, um, to preach on that in their series and got so into it. Um, I think it would be lovely to touch on it, Deuteronomy 9 next week. And then after that we've got a sequence of uh, preachers. Uh, visiting preachers with Simon Dyer, the first the young man from uh, Oak Hill in his final year there. So uh, I'm excited and looking forward um, to those weeks when we have our visiting preachers helping us to go through uh, yeah, helping us to go through Luke. Um, remember it is prayer and praise next week. So we've got our morning service um, as usual on the third and then four o'clock we got prayer and praise and we're going to hear a little bit about, more about that in a minute. Um, third um, point, it's the church prayer meeting uh, at 7.30 uh, this week. Um, I forgot to check with Brian before he went off on holiday to double check he had booked it. I'm sure he has, we're going to assume he's booked it. So come to the door that we used to use to go into the science room. Uh, it'll probably be one of the rooms further up the stairs. So I'll meet you, or somebody will meet you at that door at 7.30. And um, one final point. Um, we've had uh, a message from his parents to thank us. Must have been, I didn't know, so it's not me that he's thanked. For sending the birthday cards to Geronimo, whose birthday was last week, was it? And uh, that's just a, a lovely way to, for us to continue to show our love and our prayers for that gang uh, down in London. So whoever took the initiative there, well done. <laughs> that's what I love about this place. Everybody mocks it and, uh, and makes things happen. Uh, well done. Um, let's pray now. Let's bring uh, this time of worship to our Lord. Lord, we thank you that we can rejoice because you are king. You are the king of creation. You are above all powers and all authorities. We pray that this morning as we come and worship and praise, we will open our hearts to you. We will hear you anew. Where necessary, we will be changed molded, encouraged, lifted up, that you will meet us where we are and help us to go different people, better able to worship you in this week ahead and to witness for you into this needy, needy world. Amen. Now we're going to have a few words about prayer and praise from truths. been asked to give a few words about uh, prayer and praise. Um, the reason I love prayer and praise because it is something which is different. So we come to church every Sunday morning, we enjoy the teaching, the singing, but the prayer and praise is a bit more together. We sit in, uh, in maybe in a circle, in chairs, and We've got lovely musicians, they choose hymns and songs that are lovely. And if you wanted to choose <clears throat> any hymn at any time, you can. Uh, if you want to read something, uh, you can. If you don't want to do anything, it's okay. You just listen. I would really recommend it, that you would give it a go. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I can. Thank 
very much true. Um, a dispassionate view, um, an independent view of prayer and praise. I often go along feeling quite tired on a Sunday afternoon. I don't know about you. I've not quite got to the stage where I am, but um, and uh, I'm always revitalised um, after we come uh, out of that vulnerable time. We're now going to have our opening song. Just a few verses from Psalms. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. So let's come and praise our Lord now in song and then in a short time of prayer.
song, isn't it? Um, Simon uh, wants to come and say a few words before we start praying. No, Simon. I'd like to thank everyone first of all for the prayers for myself and Ed and my family um, during the funeral of my mum on Thursday. Uh, all things went well, we had a beautiful day as far as the weather goes and, and really, really felt your prayers and thank you very much for that. Slight downside of that, um, some of you may remember a little while ago Ever had a bit of a, um, a problem where she lost her memory for a few hours and had, took her to hospital. Um, at the wake of my mum's funeral, again, ever for about maybe 10 minutes, 5 10 minutes, didn't know where she was, didn't know who everyone was in the room, uh, got totally confused again. Um, thankfully, it didn't last long this time, only a few minutes. But it is concerning. Um, so I appreciate your prayers for Eva. It's, this is just maybe because of the stress of obviously Eva's mum dying and my mum dying and then the stress of everything maybe just built up again and that, that was what it, it was just something simple like that but um, I would appreciate the prayers but it's nothing lasting and longer. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks Simon and uh, we will pray uh, as we come together now. It's lovely to come together on a Sunday morning especially when there's all of us together a lovely part of our midweek gatherings as well, our house groups. Um, I would encourage you if you're not in a house group, if you can't manage to come along and talk, talk to me. Uh, if you want to find a house group, we'll point you in the right direction. We were just chatting before service that they might be better called life groups because when you meet with a small group week in, week out, and you pray about your lives, it becomes something like a life group. And, uh, the fact that we can now pray for Simon and Erba and other things just demonstrates that we're all in God's family. So whoever feels called to pray for this, let's pray together in an open setting.
Lord, we thank you that you are the King of Kings, that you are above all powers. We thank you for the assurance that that can give us as we travel through life and as we come as your children in prayer. And we gather this morning with hearts full of gratitude and joy amongst all the mess of life. We celebrate your reign over all creation. We acknowledge your supreme authority and majesty. You are our king. Just as you're the king of everything, even when so many people choose to ignore that title. And we lift your name high above all else. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your incredible sacrifice and love. That you came from that place where you were before time began. You gave everything for us. And through your resurrection, you have triumphed even over death. We stand in awe of your grace and mercy, which knows no bounds. Holy Spirit, we invite your presence among us this morning. We pray that you'll strengthen us as your church to stand firm in faith and to shine your light in the world this morning, but in the week ahead as well. Equip us to share the good news with boldness and to serve others with the love of Christ. Father, we're grateful for each other, for this community of believers you've placed us in. Help us to continue to support and encourage one another, to grow together in faith, and to be united in our mission to spread your love to this village and to the villages beyond. May our fellowship be a testament to your goodness and a beacon of hope to those around us. We lift our voices in praise and adoration. May our worship continue to be pleasing to you. We declare your greatness and your goodness this morning and in our lives as we go from here. And we commit our lives to your service. We come to you this morning with prayers for each other and for the world. We entrust to you again the care of those who are ill or in pain. For those who grieve. For those who are bitter. For those who feel broken. We pray that they may know the truth of your everlasting arms holding them safe. We think of Bernard still trying to get over the COVID challenges that have hit him on top of everything else. And we pray for Tina uh, as she continues to strengthen after her treatment. We thank you for the hospital staff that have gathered around Steve in these last few days. We pray, Lord, that you will give him courage and strength to work through this new challenge. We pray that you'll give Maggie stamina and strength as well as she looks to care for Steve and also look after herself. We pray, Lord, that you will give them continued spiritual strength through any discouragement and through the pain. We thank you once again for our young folk, for all those that have just started university and college and are looking to go on. We thank you for, for Sonia, who seems to be going on so well with her Lord as she grows and steps out into her own life. We thank you for our children and grandchildren. We pray especially for Caleb and, and Eleanor as they continue to grow and settle into new school life in some situations, in some cases. We pray, Lord, that you will give them teachers and carers who get to know them and are willing to show a special love to them. We pray for those who in this last year, while we've been without a pastor, 
have left us for whatever reason, perhaps like some choosing to worship more locally in their own town or village, perhaps some being dissatisfied with their spiritual life, and many others who've moved on to another phase in their life and moved to other parts of the country. We pray that those friends of ours will continue to grow in you and find a fellowship which loves them and cares for them and that preaches your word. And we pray for those others in our fellowship who are unable to be with us on a regular basis. Pray that you'll continue to be with Ruth Register and Stella, for Brian, who we don't see, see too often, and for Judy, unable to be with us. Bless them, we pray. And we thank you for what we've heard about the last week for Simon and Erga. But we pray again that you would be with Simon and Erba as they mourn more, and Erba as perhaps she faces the concern of understanding what is going on with her health. We thank you, Lord, that you are in control. As we watch our TV screens and see all the war and terrorism, and see so many of our leaders seeming to flap around from one idea to the other, our confidence comes from knowing that the King above all kings is in control. We pray that you'll continue to direct this church as we meet uh, on, uh, on Sunday the 10th to gather and consider things again. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to guide us and share and, and, and direct us. And we pray these things confident, not in our own strength, but in the strength of Jesus' precious name. Amen. Um, I don't know about you, when I was a little child, I, I was a terror for my parents. Around this time of year, I started to focus on Christmas. Not because I had so much to do at work too, but boy, that was when you got great presents. And um, from Halloween, which is coming up, which is quite a different thing in Scotland, certainly back in the 70s, um, very different expression of, uh, of uh, Celtic culture something that was really fun. You used to tour around people's houses in the district, especially older people who didn't get out, and the children would dress up, not like ghouls, but you know, I don't know, cowboys and Indians and all that sort of thing. and we'd do a party piece and duck for apples and all that sort of thing. And that was the trigger for me to start thinking about Christmas. Now it's become coming to church and seeing the boxes on the table that tells me to start thinking uh, about Christmas as we begin to think about um, the children's shoe boxes. I saw in Malawi when Ruth and I were there the delight that can come to children around the world when simply they're given for Christmas a lollipop or a bottle of lemonade. It can make such a difference to know that love. And so we're going to show a, a video. Uh, it's about four minutes long, so bear with it. But it, it's uh, it's the video. Um, from um, from the organisation, what's it called again? Just Samaritan's Purse. Hmm? Samaritan's Purse. Samaritan's Purse. Sorry, I just flipped my brain there. It's a video by Samaritan's Purse, encouraging us to take part um, and to get, to get involved. Either physical boxes, or you know, there's a website you can pick up a piece of paper that'll have the website on it, where you can do it online. Now. Here you go. A joy to their heart. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me. I want the children to know that Jesus Christ is alive and he'll come into each and every heart that invites him. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to share the gospel with children around the world. Every shoebox gift is delivered with a verbal and written proclamation of the gospel in more than a hundred countries every year. This is an evangelism project, and it all starts with a very simple shoebox gift. 
volunteers are really the heart of who we are and what we do. When we pack the boxes, it's a reflection, a little glimpse of God's love that we're pouring out. When you pack the box, pray. You never know how God is going to use that box. They go by plane, they go by riverboat, they go by motorbikes. The issue box is going to the shore in some of those isolated areas of the world. Your shoebox goes from you filling it full of toys to all ends of the earth to share the name of Jesus Christ. This box gives us a chance to show them that there is a light, that there is a truth. After receiving shoebox gifts, children are invited to a 12 lesson discipleship program, The Greatest Journey. The child is discipled, not only know God, but make God known to others. They started to know the power of prayer. They want to know more. Probably as we are seeing lives transformed for the kingdom of God. sing again. Um, everyone needs compassion, mighty to save. And then Jews <laughs> is going to come in and read our Bible passage, which is uh, from Luke 8 again. <laughs>
chapter 8, verses 22 to 39, and that's on page 1037 in the Church Bible. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. <coughs> the disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. They sailed to the region of the Gerasim, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes, or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept on the guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into, into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What's your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found a man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen him told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. Thank you, Truce. My uh, grandfather, one of my grandfathers, was a shepherd, and he always ran two sheepdogs with him. He would be able to send them out so, come by, come by, and all that sort of stuff. And he had a, he, he could whistle better than I could. He would just put his fingers in there and he could control them even with a whistle. They knew their master. Sometimes he would say, come. Sometimes he would say, stay. But they knew their master. And in the reading that we just heard, and as we'll be looking into uh, this morning, the whole universe is shown to know its master. And we are called to know our master. The reading starts, One day Jesus said to his disciples, A 
And then he was essentially saying, come, come with me. Let's go over to the other side of the lake. And so starts a, a, a series of short, four short picture miracles. And we're going to look at two of them this morning that declare Jesus as being in complete control over the physical world and the spiritual world, even the spiritual world. It's actually a great talk for as we run into Halloween and all the nonsense of that false <laughs> gimmicks around Halloween. Christ is in control. God is in control of the physical and of the spiritual world. And the Luke focuses in on these four little episodes that are almost worst case scenarios in life. Worst case scenarios in the physical and in the spiritual life. And the whole objective, I think, is for us at the end to be saying, Hallelujah! What a Saviour! So today we're going to look at the first two. Um, we're going to look at the Master's voice. And we're going to look at the Conqueror's prize. And we'll see by the end that there's certainly more than one way to hear the Master's voice and to respond. So let's see if this will continue to work. First of all, the Master's voice in verses 22 to 25. And that so famous story of the storm. If you were blessed to go to Sunday school, you have seen this, you have taught it, you have played the game, you've seen the pictures of this storm so, so many times. And the passage recounts this really serious storm, and it must have been serious, because even the disciples who were, who were uh, old salts at, at being on that lake were terrified at the storm, even the old souls. I don't know, have you ever been in a storm? In a boat? I haven't been in that much, but as a family, we once decided that we would go on a canal tour down the Caledonian Canal. You know, the one that joins Inverness down to Fort William? And uh, it's, quite a, it's quite a big canal when you're in the canal beds, but it goes across all the lochs that go down that and Loch Ness is pretty big. It's not quite the area of the Sea of Galilee, but it is big. Do you know there is more water in Loch Ness than all the lakes in the rest of the UK put together, freshwater lakes put together? It's huge. And we were going down this, and the wind was blowing up the, the loch. And our little boat started going up and down and up and down. Now, children being children, they loved this. So they went to the front of the boat to get the maximum up and downness. But me, on the wheel, I was terrified. And this was even bigger. These people were terrified. But while our children still tell the story of being bounced up and down in the boat, it's interesting that Luke spends very little time retelling the physical story. His focus is on verse 25 and the outcome on the outcome Jesus finds a teaching point at the end of this passage in verse 25 in, in this little section in verse 25 and he says for oh, the disciples who are obviously so worried these these dive in the world these salt old salt uh, disciples said master master we're going to drown got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging storm and it suddenly subsided and then he asked a question his first teaching point where is your faith where is your faith now i don't think he meant you have no faith disciples these guys had been following him and beginning to recognize who he was and beginning to have faith in him, I think what he was saying was, where is your faith in this situation? Where is your faith in this situation? Where is your faith? I wonder if we feel 
people say, and sometimes, maybe even this morning, we're feeling the same. Our faith, perhaps, is getting a little bit rocked. Perhaps we are hoping for a big miracle, like Jesus calming the storm. But the message, I think, of this picture that Luke is focusing in on, is that we should have the assurance that the disciples should have had because <coughs> Jesus was in the boat with them and Jesus was in the storm with them. My friends, we are being exhorted to take courage even this morning because our Lord Jesus came into the storm when he was born that first Christmas, the storm of life. And he promises to stay with us through all the storms of life. He's truly in the boat with us. And then the second teaching moment came when the disciples then went on. And it says, in fear and amazement. Can you imagine what it was like? this huge storm and then suddenly it goes doesn't tell us this but i just picture it as mill pond smooth imagine the amazement and the fear the fear was at his power they were fearful of him because of his power not the storm and he said, who is this that has the power over the waves and the power over the wind? I just imagine this boat going back and forward, back and forward. We've got a family here who are really into their sailing. I've only done sailing once or twice. Once was in the lovely Mediterranean. The first time was in a catch. Isn't that right? And there was about a 70 meter mast and something like a 40, 50 meter catch, which is a boat with two masts. And we were doing some, you know, outer bound stuff with DT. We were the young upperly mobile executives who were getting food. And we were in this boat and we were being fishing because we were then going to be thrown overboard literally and we had to swim to the island with the fish and survive for 24 hours and all that stuff. But they decided to send me up the mast. And this picture of this storm is what I thought, because we only had a nice swing, a nice um, set of waves, but they turned across the waves, and the mast was swinging back and forth so much that I was over the water at one end and over the water at the other end. That was the kind of storm, and I was praying that it would suddenly go calm. But it suddenly goes calm, and they recognize the power of God. And you notice that word rebuke? words are important. You see, in that word, there was a hint to Jewish people who knew their scripture of the answer to the question, who is this man? Because that very word is the word that in the Old Testament was used when God stilled the waters uh, to allow the people of Israel to pass over the Red Sea. When Moses commanded that God stilled the waters. And it's often, um, and in Psalm 107 as well, it's the picture, it's the word used in that picture of God stilling the storm to a whisper. So this, this picture isn't just randomly chosen by Luke. This miracle doesn't just randomly happen. And when the disciples ask, who is this? I'd like to believe that as they reflect on this and they've heard Jesus rebuke, they think, hold on, here's the answer. Jesus is God. God is with us in the boat. And perhaps they thought a bit like, a bit like Paul Years later, in Romans chapter 8, they thought, the lesson here, my friends, 
is God, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? But the second picture and the second lesson for us this morning is the conqueror's prize. And the second picture is that horrendous one of the man who has been filled with demons. Who's been filled with demons. Now, I don't know about you, um, and I'm not going to go into the theology of demons and demon possession and how that relates to ill health and mental health and all the rest of it. We can discuss that another time. The Bible here is being very clear, and the Bible is true. This man was filled with demons. And the picture here is once again of God being in complete control. Of Jesus was God being in complete control, not just over the physical world, which a lot of us, a lot of our friends struggle to get, but over the demonic world, over the spiritual world as well. This demon possessed man. Look at the description of this demon possessed man. In verse 27 in particular, let me find it here. He was, um, he was humiliated. He had no clothes. He was in humiliation. He was in isolation. He'd been parked off in the tombs. The tombs aren't like our graveyards. The tombs in those days, because the ground is so hard, they built the tombs above the rock, like maybe you've seen in Rome, if you've ever gone to, go to Rome. And he was living there among the dead. He's, he's under subjection because they, they drag him about, this guy. They put him in chains. It was a worst case scenario. This guy was the most degraded, mangled version of humanity that you could possibly get. But Jesus intervened and Jesus saved. Jesus had taken his followers in the boat through the storm to new territory. They'd never been there in the Gentile world on that side of the lake. They were there for new experiences. You can tell it's Gentile territory because what were they farming? Pigs. And Jews never go near pigs. I think it's a shame myself. I, there's nothing better than a bacon butty, is there? But hey, and uh, living in Suffolk, within a fellowship which was full of farmers, there was they were either chicken farmers or they were pig farmers, most of them. My uncle was a pig farmer, so I know what it was like to have a huge herd of pigs squealing away. And pig farming is extremely lucrative in good years here, and it was probably extremely lucrative for them there in Malawi. You were wealthy if you had a few pigs in your back garden because you could feed them anything and you end up with something you can sell what's better than that and perhaps that's why these guys when this township when they saw what happened to their pigs when the spirit for whatever reason let's not go into the fine detail when the spirits asked to recognize jesus for who he was and asked to be put into the pigs and they ran off the cliff you can tell that it was a worldly reaction get out of here You've killed all our prophet. Prophet. Get it. It was lucrative. Jesus came, and this guy who was the lowest of humanity, degraded and mangled, and at a word of command, he was completely saved. And the spiritual storm became a spiritual physical and spiritual storm to live upon. And Luke drives home the historicity of this. As the witnesses fled, what did the man do? He sat at Jesus' feet in his right mind. None of us, my friends, can ever be more broken than that None of our friends 
our neighbors, our children, our parents can ever be more broken than that man. And Jesus said, Jesus said. But just like the disciples, we read in verse 35, I think something interesting. They weren't just annoyed at losing their money. They were annoyed, they were fearful of what Jesus had done. They were fearful of what Jesus had done. Verse 35, let me find it. And the people went out to see, so the man does as he spoke, and he goes off and he starts, we'll come back to that, he starts witnessing to the people around about. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demon had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed, dressed for the first time probably in decades, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they were afraid. They recognized something of the power of this man, Jesus. And what was their response? What was their response? They asked Jesus to leave. And what did Jesus do? He left. That's terrible. It's a terrible story. And my friends, it's a truth that we need to understand. And our friends and our neighbors and our brothers and our sisters need to understand. Jesus is a gracious man. And if we choose, presented by the, by the righteous power of Jesus, to say go, he will go. It's a terrible thing. But if we say, come, come in, he allows us to sit as his feet worst of storms to be can. They recognize the great presence of power, but rather than sitting at his feet, they said, go, and he went. And then, interestingly, rather than as he had said to the disciples, come with me across the sea, this man is desperate to go with Jesus. And what does Jesus say to the man? No. Stay. Stay where you are. And he doesn't say, stay where you are, do a first degree in theology, then a master's in evangelism, maybe then a PhD on something, and then talk to your friends and family. He, sa he says something really simple. What does it, doesn't it? Return home and tell them how much God has done for you. That's all we are called to do. At its simplest, that is witness in our lives. We don't need to be fancy. We just need to be courageous. Recognize what Jesus has done for us like this man. And go and gossip into our lives what Jesus has done for us. That's not too difficult, is it? If you're terrified by that, like I am, it's not because it's difficult. <laughs> it's because of that challenge of stepping out for Jesus. The disciples asked, who is this? What is our answer? This morning even, do we recognize Jesus for who tr he truly is? That good shepherd above all powers, the creator, the sustainer, the commander of the natural world, the commander of the demonic world. As we as we travel through the trials and tribulations of life, are we hearing Jesus saying, where is your faith? Because
because we're allowing the storms to come in, are we ready to cling firm to this promise and reality that Jesus is in the boat with us in the storms, taking us to the other side? Faced with identical fact, some men chose to follow Jesus to the other side. Some men asked him to go. Where's her heart this morning, if we're honest, even as disciples? What is Jesus asking of us this morning? He asked some disciples to come over to the other side. And perhaps some of us are being called to new stars, to new directions, to new commitments. As a fellowship, it's good that coming a lot, we're in a week or so's time, we're coming again to a time to pause and look back and look forward. But are there others that what God's saying to us is, don't wait to witness. Stay at home and gossip the gospel for me. Simply explain to your friends and your enemies what Jesus has done for you. There's more than one way to serve our Lord. Remember we were thinking about Eric Little and we were concluding that we have a path and a race to run this for us individually. How is Jesus asking you to live for him? going or by staying. But Miles, this is the time for his prize. What's the prize? You haven't talked about the prize yet. You know what it is, don't you? The conqueror's prize was the disciples safely across the lake and the man stormed broken man is the prize. Let us burn, let us our hearts this morning burn with gratitude that that God of all creation so loved us that he sent the ultimate valentine into the world of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he sent his son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus prize, what the Bible tells us, I can't get my head around it, that Jesus prize and glory is us, his newfound bride, the church, and that when we are together with him in heaven, it will be that will be his glory in heaven. Hallelujah. If God is for us, who can be against us? As Paul said in Romans 8, For I am convinced that neither angels nor even demons like that were in that man can separate us from the love of God. Even this week ahead, my friends, let us listen for the come and for the stay. And then let's live out a life assured because God is in the boat with us through what Jesus has done for us. To go through the storm with us and God is willing and able to get alongside us no matter how broken we feel that we can have that peace that, that that man knew when his life was transformed and he was in his right mind and he was at the feet of Jesus. Hallelujah. What a master. Hallelujah.
what I see here. I'm going to sing again. And uh, it's a rather relevant if old church arrives, which encourages us to rise, to go out, and to proclaim this wonderful king. spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously 
graciously give us all things. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sorrow? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let's pray. Lord God, as we go here, thank you that we can go, so many of us, knowing that you are the God beside us in the Lord. And we can look back at so many times when we knew the wonder of you sometimes choosing to calm the storm, but always choosing to be with us through the storm. We thank you that we can go in assurance that you are the loving Saviour who came to us, the most broken of people, and allowed us to sit at your feet and gave us all necessary to be able to come to your feet in righteousness through what you did on the cross for us. As we go from here, help us to gossip the gospel by being courageous about the truth of what you have done in our lives. And may you continue to fit us for heaven that we might see you there and know that you greet us as faithful servants.